Hello, my name's Graham, call sign G4VUX, and in this video I'd like to show you the process that I adopted to build myself a replica or near replica of the famous World War II Paraset. The parasets were originally used in World War II. They were built at Wadden Hall in Buckinghamshire, quite close to my home, and they were used by the Special Operations Executive Agents, spies to you and I, who were operating behind enemy lines in occupied countries in Europe. The paraset is a lightweight, compact, self-contained transceiver requiring an external power supply, um, an aerial and an earth. The aerial would be a long wire. The frequency of operation would be determined by a crystal which the operator would plug into here. He would then press the Morse key, this button here, adjust the aerial tuning components, these two controls here, for maximum brightness on these lamps. At that point, the transmitter was tuned to the frequency of the crystal. The receiver dial calibration would be read off from a graph, and he would tune that to the right setting, adjust the regeneration, and listen for the request to send from his uh, controller in, in the United Kingdom, switch to transmit, and send his message. The first time I saw a schematic for the Paraset was in 1982 when it was published in Radio Communication. This version, which has obviously been redrawn, has been uploaded to the internet by SM7UCZ. Just to talk you through it very quickly, uh, we have a 6v6 transmitter here operating in culprit configuration um, with a tuning coil which has been designed to work into a high impedance, a long wire antenna. And on this side of the drawing um, we have a Hartley oscillator forming the basis of a regenerative receiver followed by an audio amplifier um, which would drive a, a headphone. The whole circuit is powered for 350, 360 volts, I think that is, uh, <laughs> over here uh, with 6 volts for the, for the heater. Having added the uh, component references to the schematic, I was able to produce a full items list of all the electronic components and some of the other stuff too, like the, um, the cable bands, the chassis, the housing, uh, terry clips to hold the valves in place in the lid, and even undercoat and primer for the, for the, for the uh, wooden box. Okay, let's see what I've got. I've now procured all the parts. So here we have the, the chassis, which comes uh, from a company in Birmingham. It's not fully drilled, but it's quite good. I had some wood cut up to size to make the enclosure. Um, there are the other electronic components here. Things that may be of interest, the coil former here, this, this, uh, this one here. This is for the transmitter tank coil. That will be made from 40 millimeter waste pipe. The receiver tuning coil will be wound onto 21mm waste pipe. There are the valve holders there, power cable. Crystals that I use with other valve transmitters that I've built. I'll be using a 10 turn pot for the reaction control to make it a bit smoother. There's the dial, the Paraset dial. That came from the same chap who sold me the chassis. The knob. This has come from an old piece of test equipment. I'll have to drill, drill, <coughs> drill three little holes in this dial to mount the knob. That's my template for drilling the knob, which has three little holes in the bottom. And then that will fix onto, onto here. I think it'll look quite smart. You'll see it later. Okay, what else is of interest here? There are the valves. 
The valves actually were a problem. Two of them I found or sourced from the UK. The 6V6 metal was a bit tricky and I had to import that from America. The case will, lid will be hinged with what they call hook over hinges so it can be clipped on, lifted off and removed completely. Otherwise it will stress the hinge when it's open. The power connector, standard power connector for all my valve radios, they all have a flying lead and this kind of connector which goes into my standard 300 volt, 6.3 volt power supply. Right, uh, I've wound the coils. This is a receiver coil. It has three windings, four turns, three turns and 32 turns. It's on 21.5 millimeter waste pipe. It'll be fixed to the chassis by means of a little plate that goes through there, through there, and then I can grip it with a screw from the bottom. This is the other coil. This is the anode winding for the transmitter valve. This is the antenna coupling winding. And these two single turn windings are for the lamps, the two light bulbs, which are used to tune the output circuit of the transmitter. I've made a few changes to the original design to suit my own personal requirement. The built-in MOS key will be a push button switch. The wave change has two poles. The second pole will be used to add capacitance to the low value main tuning component uh, so that I only cover small portions of 40 and 80 meters on receive. The mechanical reduction drive in my model has been replaced with a very low value band spread capacitor here. The audio output choke, I, I've done away with that, I'll be using a filament transformer, back to front if you will, giving me a very low impedance output suitable for headphones or external speaker. And the DC power will be coming in through a cable permanently attached and fitted via this cable gland. The mechanical engineering is basically finished now. The chassis drilling is finished, all the components are mounted on the chassis. And if I turn it around, it's beginning to look a bit like a paraset. I have added an additional jack socket here, which will be used for the external key. I think, to be honest, this internal key even when it's got its nice little button on it, will still be impractical for day-to-day -day use on 40 and 80. I haven't yet put the light bulbs in here, that's why there are holes there. The under chassis wiring was very straightforward and surprisingly quick. I don't make uh, plans or drawings, I just work directly from the circuit diagram for things as simple as this and it went together very well. If I just move this I can show you the new housing. This is a new box. It's made from 6mm MDF. The previous one was made from 12mm MDF and it was really far too chunky and heavy and also a bit tall. It looked a bit odd. So I've made a new one and this one is actually quite nice. This will come off. Uh, they are the valves and to give you an idea of scale, that's a DVD inside the box. It just fits inside the box that way. So that kind of tells you that this transceiver was incredibly small and by 1940s standard it was a real achievement to make a transmitter receiver in a housing of this size. Thanks for watching this. I hope that you've, uh, you've found it interesting. I thoroughly enjoy building my Paraset and I do intend to use it on air. If you intend to make one, 
I would strongly suggest that you opt for a transistorized version for reasons of safety. There are plenty of circuits on the internet for transistorized power sets. Uh, and I think I read somewhere recently that one of the American QRP clubs is producing a kit, uh, believe it or not. So that could be even better because hopefully it'll all be there and you can just solder it together. Um, if you just want to build a regenerative receiver, and why not? They really are fun. You can demodulate um, broadcast bands, SSB, CW, it's a fan they're fantastic. Um, I do intend to design a regen receiver as a club project um, to try and encourage some uh, home construction among my fellow club members. Um, that will be available, I think, on the internet on this channel by the end of the summer. I, I don't do much, uh, much work in the summer, so I guess about September, October 2017 you can expect to see uh, that project on the internet. Any questions or comments, please let me know. Um, I'm perfectly happy to, to respond if I can. I don't provide any information about uh, the plans and things because I don't really use them. I'm not being nasty. I just, I've been doing this sort of thing for well over 50 years. I don't need plans anymore. Thanks a lot and hopefully we'll catch up again soon. 73.